It's, on. it's live. Aktung, everybody. <laughs> There's my German. I am <laughs> I'm Alan Levine coming to you from morning time in Strawberry, Arizona for a virtually connecting session. We're really excited. This apparently is the first. Uh, Christian, I'm already forgetting. We're, it's sort of in German, but you're doing it in English, which I don't fully understand. But um, yeah. uh, sorry, Christian, Christian Friedrich is from um, Friedrich is from um, at OER Camp 17 in Germany, which I understand he will tell us is a series of kind of bar camps about open ed, and so he's got a room full of hopefully eager people who want to learn about uh, virtually connecting. Is that right? That's yes. about right. Absolutely. Yes, we're um, connecting to you from Hamburg in Germany. This is the third of a series of four OER camps here in Germany that basically run uh, in a line of events that are funded by the German Ministry of Education. Um, so we have a series of events, and they're all different to some extent, but what they all have in common is that they're cross-sectional across um, uh, different sectors of education, from school and even kindergarten up to higher ed and, um, and training, education. advanced training, adult education and all that. And um, given that we are only eight people in the room, I think we could do a quick round of introduction around here as well, so that you guys know, to you, know, know who you're speaking to, right? Yeah, whatever. We'll do that. Well, you go ahead. Hi, everybody. I'm Toby. Um, I'm, yeah coordinating one of those projects that are funded that is funded by um, the Federal Ministry of uh, Education um, so we currently have got money um, for 18 months to raise awareness um, in our disciplines and uh, our sectors um, and what we do we actually work cross-sectoral so we try to um, address schools we try to address uh, higher education institutions and um, the um, teacher training as well. So, um, yeah, that's, I think, enough for me. <laughs> Great. Uh, hi, I'm oh, sorry. Hi, my name is Christina. I'm working in the same project as Tobias. Um, so I can um, just uh, keep it short. I'm organizing the, the teacher trainings, especially in the higher education trainings um, for open education. <laughs> hi there, I'm Miriam. I've worked at a project called Hamburg Open Online University, and I help scientists create open education resources. Hi, my name is Marco. Um, I'm from the oldest town in Germany, Trier, and um, I'm from an organization of education in sports. Hi, my name is Thomas. I work in a project funded in this uh, OER funding line as well. And it's about civic education and service learning in combination with um, open educational resources. So it's about uh, it's it's this interface between those two fields of innovation in teaching and learning that is um, conveyed by the engagement in both lines. Uh, hi, my name is Valentin. Um, I'm, uh, I'm working for Wikimedia Germany and um, I'm also the coordinator of the Alliance of uh, Open Education. Um, this is a, a lobby organization trying to um, well, do the political side of the work for open educational resources in Germany. So we're trying to do our best to, to uh, open up the situation for, for open educational resources. Uh, hello everybody, Markus here. I'm uh, participating in the OER camps with my OER project jointly, which takes care of all the other OER projects. So I, uh, I'm looking forward to all these people and make sure that they are all happy and things are progressing with OER. And hi there, I'm Martina and I'm running this, I'm, I'm the virtual connecting on-site body doing this together with uh, Christian. And we have one, oh. you just dropped in. So just to, to be clear, we're um, live streaming and recording to the internet. So, and if you want to give a quick round of introduction, who you are um, and what you work on. I can do that, sure. Hi, my name is Stephanie, and I work um, with grown-ups and especially um, in the language department. All right. All right. I think we want to hear from other fascinating projects as we went around. Um, 
Maybe if you could yes. mute the mic a little bit, Chris. There you go. Perfect. Uh, Ken did that. Smooth operation here. Uh, so just to introduce you quickly, um, I'm Alan Levine. I'm coming to you from the big metropolis of Strawberry, Arizona, uh, where it's morning. And uh, we're, like, very impressed that you guys are talking to us in English. And um, I thought we'd unimpress you with our knowledge of German. Um, <laughs> and so I was trying to think of a German word that I knew. And, and in the political scene, all I could think of is, like, there are people around here with a lot of Schadenfreude going on. And, and I don't like that. But we're not going to talk about that. We're talking about openness. And I'm going to pass it over uh, to Christina Hendricks uh, from Vancouver. Say hello, Christina. Hi, I'm Christina Hendricks. I'm from Vancouver. <laughs> I live in Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to be joining you all. Look at your background. That's beautiful. I'm outside. I'm at a conference and I need to, you know, find a place. So, yeah. <laughs> all right. And then we'll go down to uh, Ken Bauer, the Canadian in Mexico. Um. Good morning from here. I'm located in Guadalajara, Mexico, Associate Professor of Computing Science here and an active virtual buddy um, with Virtually Connecting. We like your title, Rebel Rouser. And then over to uh, Lorna Campbell over in Scotland where it's probably late afternoon, is that right? It is indeed. It's late on Friday afternoon here. Uh, my name is Lorna Campbell. I work at the University of Edinburgh, but um, I'm actually dialing in today from Glasgow, from home. Um, I work as OER liaison at the university and I'm also on the board of um, the Association for Learning Technologists here and also Wikimedia UK. So hello to the uh, Wikimedians in Germany there as well. Excellent. Great to see you, Lana. And then Mahabali in Cairo, Egypt. Hi, I'm Mahabali. I'm the co-director of Virtually Connecting and that's probably the biggest open thing that I do. Um, and I work at the American University in Cairo as a faculty developer. I'm looking forward to talking to you all. Great. And then uh, over to Sarah Croson, who's, I think, somewhere in the UK. That's all I know. <laughs> Hello. I'm Sarah Jane Croson. Um, I work as scholarship development manager for a very small art college. And we work in CBHE, which is college-based higher education. So it's higher education in a further education college. I love this kind of setup because it lets me take part and learn and participate in knowledge exchange, even though I'm from a relatively small organization. Great. It's great to have you. And like, I'm just like nicely overwhelmed by our geographic and all kinds of diversity here. So this is what we love about virtually connecting. And so, um, Kristen, I, I completely forgot what we were going to do. It's just a, a kind of an open discussion, some about virtual connecting. Um, but I, I bet that some of us here on this side would like to hear a little more how this, um, this bar camp format is running um, for um, all the folks who are gathered there. Yeah, so just leave a few sentences on that and then give it up to, to the rest of us because I think everybody's here but is a bit anxious to, to connect with you as well. Um, so the, the sessions today and the, the day overall is not only cross-sectional, but it's also um, different from, from the usual ed tech event in terms of um, organization. And we had a couple of planned and pre-proposed workshop um, this morning and this afternoon as well but there are also um, sessions that are delivered and facilitated by on-site participants as we speak and they're pretty much planned as we speak as well uh, and basically the, the concept is that people who attend the conference make up the con the conference itself so it's almost like a, a Dave Cormier approach to conferencing in terms of the the people as the curriculum so to speak um, and the, the idea of why we wanted to um, try and do virtually connecting here from, from the OER camp was that we, and this has been an ongoing theme throughout like OER 17 and conferences like that, but, but also other communities and sub-communities out in the open, that there are many communities around open and education and digital media and learning and teaching and all that, but that they somewhat only by accident intersect and um, <laughs> and virtually connecting seems to be a great opportunity and a great place to, to change that and I think the, um, uh, the the session the format but especially the group of participants that we have here really speaks to that and apart from that I'm just happy to be here and to be virtually connecting with all of you 
is is this kind of format something common or uncommon for for your area to have a an unconference style? There's it depends. depends. I mean, there's there's a tradition almost. I'm not sure if you can call it a tradition yet of bar camps and education camps that, that are run like bar camps, like on conferences. Well, actually, there's more in the software and yeah. development yeah. sector. I know that. Uh, uh, yeah, a tradition of bar camps actually from uh, the WordPress community. Like there was um, not high profile pro ed, um, um, developers, but uh, uh, those yeah, freelance developers and those um, who actually yeah, just use WordPress come together in the bar camp session. And this happens all over the place, like in the US, in, in Germany, in the UK. Uh, Two weeks ago, there's been a work, WordPress camp in Euro, uh, WordPress camp Europe in Paris. So um, this is quite common in, in in some ways, I would say. Uh, I think there's sort of uh, there used to be like about ten years ago, there yeah. used to be quite a hype about bar camps and all these unconferences, and uh, it's sort of got a, um, it's sort of got lost on the way uh, in a sense. Uh, but um, um, especially in the education, uh, in the education system I get the I get the feeling the strong feeling that um, since we're talking about digitalization in, in education all the time it's like okay we need something new and uh, we need to you know and we need to come up with something new and then they come up with a bar camp or something like this uh, <laughs> so sometimes uh, and um, yeah but I, 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 I for me it's um, I, I enjoy the, the bar camp sessions mostly more than the, the, the regular conference part because um, I never, I never like the, the the style of conference where you listen like forty five minutes to one speaker and then you get to say like at least like three people get to ask one question and then it's over again. It's pretty boring and uh, so um, I, I seriously enjoy these part of the the, uh, the way uh, you can participate in, in these kind of sessions and you can offer them as well. That's the most important yeah. thing. Yeah, uh, like the virtual connection. Oh, the echo Sorry. is horrible. I think virtually connecting is sort of like the virtual unconference of all the conferences right now, right? Because you, regular conferences that are not on conferences, where you have those 45 minutes or whatever, if they live stream that on the internet, you're still seeing the 45 minutes. But then when you come to virtually connecting, it's just a conversation with some of the people there, and then you, you know, it becomes its own thing. And it's not necessarily planned, and, and it devolves in, in whatever direction goes. And so that uh, sort of, to me, feels like that's what virtually connecting does all the time. But with, and uh, like version of that. and the, the hang up usually, uh, at least in North America, is that generally people's funding to be able to go to conferences is based upon doing more traditional presentations. And institutions don't always fund people to go to a conference that has no structure. We do need to change that, though. I'm yeah. Not who should be, or, I mean, like, we're not the powerful people, but someone needs to change that. We're changing it right now. Darn it. We are to a certain degree, but the thing is, um, for most conferences here in Germany, at least the big ones, they're still very formal and they're very structured as well. And for them, um, an unconference, a bar camp is still something like, whoa, what's going on? So I think it's, it, it very much depends on who you're talking to. Um, I mean, the people in this room, for them it's a, a very ordinary thing, but for most people in, in, in traditional higher education, it's like they've never heard about this before. And they, my feeling is they would also have a slight problem with opening up a traditional conference to a public, to network publics as we're doing this now, um, simply because of the factor of control. You can't control it. Yes. I agree. <laughs> Strongly. Yeah, I, we probably have a lot of synchronicity in the room. I, I, Christian, did you want to just freeform this or, I mean, this was kind of pitched to talk about virtual connecting, which most people here just love talking about virtual <laughs> connecting. But, you know, I don't know, you know, depends what the familiarity in the room is with this. Obviously, you can see what we're doing. Um, this is not very structured. Um, we're not using fancy enterprise technology, and we're just kind of getting together. Yeah, I think what the, the overall aim was, uh, speaking of communities that are somewhat connected and disconnected to, to basically introduce the idea to the people here at OER camp that an opportunity like this exists and to, on the one hand, there are, and especially after the last session we had, people approached me and said that there are ways to do something like virtually connecting within Germany and, and in the 
like in German language and all that, because there are obviously people who can't make it here um, because of like everything from foot injuries to pregnancies to illness. <laughs> um, but also to but also to connect the, the German open community a bit more and a bit better, even in an informal, not so structured way with other communities that are out there, and basically just to throw out this opportunity and see what people online and people on site make of that. So that was basically the structure we had, and not much more. I have so, a question. Uh, <laughs> Christina. Yes. So, so I've been uh, just doing virtually connecting for a little while. I mean, I've kind of been in and out, but but my understanding is that most or all of it has been in English. So I'm wondering, you know, is the idea to try to kind of spin off different groups or to sort of hopefully take some of what we're doing and then connect it to other language communities? I mean, I love the idea of it not only being in English. I'm just curious what people are thinking about that. Probably. I mean, I don't. I don't know. Well, there's a master plan for virtually connecting. I mean, it sounds like what Christian. I mean, anybody. You can do this. You know, a lot of us do this kind of at a smaller scale with our teaching. You know, it's just a way to connect classes. And so, um, but the idea about you know, um, you know, opening up the conference format to either you're there or you're not there or you're just watching the stream of a keynote um, is really powerful. And so. Um, Personally, I think I, I hope people kind of do their own riffs on it and figure out ways um, to try it out. So it's, um, I'll, I'll let Maha say something about it, but it's not like virtual connecting owns this kind of process. We've just been kind of doing it and evolving it. Yeah, and I think Martina, you had a point as well. Yeah, just in an ideal world, we would actually, Christina, we would actually see spin offs in, in, in German, in French, in Spanish, and whatever. Um, but for now, I think English is just the lingua franca. It's the easiest, you know, common denominator. It's the easiest thing to do. Simple as that. Because I think we're still in the early stages of these things. Um, and once we get along the process, you'll see more and more spin-offs. And mm. it, it'll be like a bit of a puzzle, connecting here, connecting there, connecting, you know, in different ways um, as well. And then, and obviously, I mean, once we are there and once we use different languages, the the, the the, the whole conversation will, will get a different quality um, because obviously some of the things that we're talking about here are very, very much influenced by the culture, the German culture, for instance, as opposed to different cultures as well. And it doesn't have to be necessarily uni language. You know, the project that Ken and I worked on in, in Guadalajara, we were doing these weekly hangouts with our faculty, and, and basically we just encouraged at one point for them, just talk in Spanish, ignore us English people. Uh, but we'd flip back and forth every now and then, and, and you kind of work sometimes in that in-between space. You know, same work, Ken? And I, and I, yeah, I was going to say the same thing, and I think it, when you do that and how we did that, um, that's where I think I helped some way is that I, I was the glue between both the cultures, because I'm a Canadian living in Mexico, but also the, the language barrier. I helped bridge that as well, I think. And it's a nice, nice message. It's not just like this is a German thing or this is an English thing. It's, you know we can figure out ways to um, to try and bridge it. I've done cross-cultural dialogue between people from the Western world and the Arab Muslim world, and we do that bilingually, uh, like with human translation, like someone would speak and one of the facilitators would translate and type. Um, now, we don't, I think, have the technology right now for the technology to do that on its own, and there would be a lot of misunderstandings, and if it's like a sensitive issue, it would be a huge issue, right? Uh, with all the nuances of language. Uh, but I think, for now, I, I like humans as the translation for that kind of thing, but I think if you reach more than two or three languages, and then it goes crazy, right? Yeah. yeah. So with this yeah. cross-cultural dialogue, there's English and Arabic, and then if someone is from Pakistan, they're Muslim, but they don't speak Arabic, then it just, it breaks down. Um, but maybe someday. And there's something, there's something really powerful just seeing people where they live. I mean, looking at the icons here, and you know, Christina's outside a glass building, Ken's in his office, I've been there, Maha's in her mother's house, Sarah's kind of like backlit by her window, and I'm in my kitchen, and, and like you go beyond like what you do in the text world, um, uh, you get to know people just a little bit through this little, little box. It, it sounds kind of corny, but to me it's powerful, and, and when um, I, the class I taught with Mia Zamora was just, this chance to have people have a conversation who never would because we live in different parts of the world. And, and my, my favorite 
moment was with these students um, in Puerto Vallarta, where at one point someone said, there's a lot of light in your room. Show us out your window. We just went crazy. We turned the cameras. We were showing each other what was out the windows of our campuses. And it was a magical, spontaneous moment. We were having a conversation before Alan as well. I was going to cut up Laura the story there. Um, his dog got all excited because we were talking with each other. And, and Alan said his dog liked virtual hangouts. But I think there's an emotion that comes off us as we're doing this. And his dog can definitely detect that. Hi, hi Felix. He's sleeping right now. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. I think it's really nice to be able to situate people um, in their own environment, and whether that's their work environment or their home environment, I think it does actually add a different dimension to the conversations, and I really like that. Um, and it's quite nice getting to know people as well. And so, you know, some oh, there he is. Um, sometimes, you know, I'm I'm here at home. Sometimes I'm dialing in from conferences, and it's it's just it. I think it's certainly it does help with the connection, seeing people in different places. And I, I've got several cats here who are trying to get in on the act as well. If you, if you see a sort of black plume going past the screen, it'll be my cat's tail. <laughs> you don't get I'm, this I'm in sorry. the MOOC. I don't have any pets or animals to offer right now. And I, I think, Tom, you had a yeah, point I, I, you as well. I, I, I really enjoy the setting and I see all this, you know, computer-mediated communication, and this is via audio and video. And I'm just wondering, I mean, what's the fuss? Because, I mean, we can Skype, we, it, it's been around. So what's special about virtually connected? And I would be really interested in how you facilitate maybe different settings, like in a conference. In the beginning, we were speaking about the usual conference and an unconference as a very broad distinction. So, what is your experience about facilitating different styles for different goals and, and all these? That would really help me to understand how to, you know, in a methodical way, uh, facilitate such sessions and what what targets or goals you can actually reach in a session and and how you how you deal about it. What's, What's your experience? Yeah. What are your recommendations? I think I think the key thing about virtually connecting versus just Skyping with someone for a meeting or something is that people at a conference are taking time away from the conference to include virtual people who aren't there. And uh, the point for someone like me who doesn't travel a lot was that I was missing out on all these important conversations. So I talk to people on Twitter all the time and I meet them on Hangouts like this, each of us from our homes or our offices regularly. But when there's a conference going on, there's a lot of buzz and there's a lot of energy going on. And there are conversations in our field advancing and things happening. And if you don't go to conferences at all, you totally miss out on that. But if you do it, this virtually connecting thing, people at the conference take time out to spend time and talk to people who aren't there. And it sort of influences us who aren't there, but it also influences the conference itself by giving them the outside perspective. And I think in that way, if you do it often enough, and we now do it so often that I think it's just kind of crazy. But I, I think I go to something like 20 conferences a year through virtually connecting. And, and those conversations are much more valuable, I think, than going to presentations. Because, you know, whoever, if someone that is really important in my field, I'm probably reading their blog, I've probably read their peer-reviewed paper, I know what they're doing. But having these conversations with them is what's enriching for me. And that's, that's what I think virtually connecting does versus um, organizing other hangouts for other purposes that aren't part of a conference is a very different kind of thing. And Lorna wanted to say something. Yeah, it was just to absolutely agree with um, what you said, Maha. It's, um, I mean, I, I, I traveled some conferences during the year, usually in the UK. It's, it's difficult for me to travel ch further because of childcare. And it's, it's that element of inclusivity, I think, which is great because I think, um, you know, conferences of, of all kinds, whether they're um, bar camps or unconferences or more formal conferences, they're, they're great if you're there, but it's how, how can you sort of extend that to other people who don't have that opportunity? And I think that's one of the things that's been really powerful about V-Connecting is bringing in that wider community and being able to involve them in discussions and dialogue. And one of the other things I really like about these sessions is that um, you quite often, you get, it's nice to get a broad overview of the themes that emerge from the conferences. So you're not just getting, you know, here's you know one presentation or this is what the keynote said what you tend to find that bubbles up the surface is the sort of broad themes um that are emerging from these conferences so um 
I certainly think it's it really adds that other dimension. I mean, it's it's great being able to follow conference hashtags on Twitter, but this adds another much more, I think, personal dimension to it. So, so that's what I certainly find really powerful about it. And to me, it's always like it's the part of the conference that happens between the sessions. This is what we're, what we're trying to do is those uh, the hall conversations, uh, which often at a conference is very pressed. But I'd say also like when you're on site, um, it's pretty exciting to like bring the experience um, to the virtual audience too. It kind of changes the way you think about how can you communicate what's going on at a conference in about the 15 or 20 minute window uh, that you have. And also um, the unstructuredness of it, which some people might find discomfort to me is like, has the most potential for the unexpected and the serendipity. And so, I mean, all these people um, virtually that I see here, I cross paths on Twitter and blogs, um, but we don't really have extended conversations because social media is just kind of passing by. Um, and so it, it's a real you know, networking, but it's Jason. Oh my God, it's Jason Paul. Say hello, Jason. Oh, he's, just, he, he's a hangout crasher. Um, so if, if I were to, to add to that in terms of what makes virtually connecting special, just from my point of view, would be that having the content and having the live stream of a talk or something like that um, as content and or as input is good on the one thing, on the one hand, but you're never able to attend the conferences that go on all over the world. That's the one thing. So for whatever reason, you might not be able to do that. But for me, more importantly, um, I like when people who I trust and who I know to some extent, who, whose work I know, to frame those conferences, to frame those events, to frame those talks. So uh, having someone at a conference and having watched the keynote, for example, and then framing it in terms of um, this and that was great, but he totally misunderstood this part. Or um, I don't understand why the atmosphere when Audrey Waters talked about this or that or whatever it is. Um, was was different there, and having that conversation that is like between those spaces, and not uh, not all about the content, but also about the perception of what you can actually make of that content in your own field. That I find a more valuable source for me and my work than the content itself. I think so. The interpretation, those those spaces in between, and virtually connecting with people who are at those spaces and at those conferences. Uh, for me, uh, adds value to that and, and a richness that I otherwise would miss out on. And, and, and probably for, um, is that Thomas who asked that? Um, it may sound like words, but it sounds like we're all enthusiastic about it. I think the experience of it is usually what speaks to it more. Um, as, uh, I think Alan roboted completely there. And of course, these things happen, right? And he might get kicked out completely because he's totally black for me right now. I'm just going to add one more thing there is that one of the things with high, very high profile people who are keynotes uh, or whatever, in, real, in, in regular times, it's quite difficult to get them to come to a hangout just like this one. But when they're at a conference and we ask them to give us 20 minutes of their time, they do. And it gives people an opportunity to, to meet them and talk to them unplugged, you know, not the way they perform on stage, but the way they have a conversation. And people who are like graduate students or very early in their careers who wouldn't ever imagine having the opportunity, even at a conference, to have a private conversation with that person, get that opportunity through virtually connecting. And they say it really, really makes a difference to them. And we're very lucky that um, it started out because I know a lot of those people, but I think now it just becomes, it's, it's become something that a lot of people are willing to do. Um, is that a lot of these high profile people are willing to come in and, and have a talk like this. It's not like they're saying, no, I don't have time for you. We're not paying them anything. None of our buddies are paid anything, but people are willing to spend like 20, 30 minutes to have these conversations. I think it's also nice as well. I mean, you mentioned earlier on, Maha, the, the buzz you get from conferences that doesn't quite often translate if, you know, if you're just following a hashtag on Twitter, for example. And I think one of the things that V-Connecting does sometimes that I really like is the walkthroughs, just like walking the halls around a conference. And that can be really nice because you, you get a real feeling of it for, you know, who's there and what the atmosphere is like. And uh, it, it kind of like brings in that sort of like social 
element, I think, of, of conferences. Is it as well, perhaps, about um, the conference as itself can be seen as a very formal structure and a very kind of power boundary structure. But actually, when you look at why they're there, it's all about sharing ideas. And I think what Virtually Connecting does for me is it opens up this idea of sharing and idea sharing, with, re regardless of the structure that's kind of underpinning it. This is a particular kind of low key structure. I'm really interested in the idea of these the, the, the camps that you've got in Germany, because that sounds like a mirrored structure, something more like virtually connecting than the traditional sort of knowledge, knowledge, um, you know, passive knowledge that you almost get. So we've got sort of active knowledge and an informal atmosphere. And that to me is the most exciting way of participating and generating ideas, as well as um, sort of just listening to them. I apologise as well by the fact of my backlighting. I'm in my daughter's bedroom because I drove home from work, picked my youngest from from nursery and my oldest is looking after her downstairs so it gives you an idea of the pace of life and at the end of it I get this opportunity to talk to people I would never meet in my day-to-day -day job and get these great ideas and, and spark and I can take those back to my home institution and so we spread and share ideas in a kind of very organic way I think perhaps I was going to say, Sarah, that's exactly why I do this as well. Go ahead, Christian. Yeah. No, I, I really agree. I mean, what, what is more important, especially nowadays, than to share to share ideas and to connect? I mean, it's, it sounds simple, but obviously, obviously it's not. The world shows us that we all thought it would be simple, but right now it's really difficult. And uh, yeah, I just really agree from my heart. Um, another thing that comes to my mind is that um, virtually connecting allows me to own um, a conference that I go to in a, in a completely different way. Um, because while I'm on site and when I actually talk, especially now because I talk a lot in German obviously at this conference, um, and there's also the, as I said before, the, the language culture matter. And I think um, what happens is that you get so engulfed in your in your own ways of thinking and in your, in your own sort of um, ideas and ways as well and, and virtually connecting gives this um, added dimension of international things so you can almost when, when you talk to people um, within a virtual connecting session you can always sort of cross check and, and get a different perspective and I think this is so important in, in, in today's um, times where, where we need more internationalization especially with the emergence of more nationalism um, I think it is it is it's vital um, to to have an outlet that takes you out of your own mind. Uh, I hope my robot voice isn't working, but um, I got I got to say, like over in the in the side of the chat, everybody is like going, "Oh my God, we want to keep that." Allows me to own a conference in a completely different way, and it's almost like reclaiming the conference experience from the kind of way it's manufactured. Yeah, just as a short, maybe just as a short question um, or first input then question. Um, I must say I absolutely love what you guys doing because it's just, it's so refreshing for uh, those people who are used to go to German conferences, and I feel it's just yeah, really opening up culture in a different way because it's yeah infusing um, different ways of uh, interacting within a conference scheme um, with other people. And I was wondering about, um, do you have experiences with other cultures like national or regional cultures where you came across um, yeah, confrontations, so to speak, which um, yeah, just denied those, uh, those uh, interactions? So where you approached people and then uh, they, they tried something out and then just said, no, nah, that's not for us. So you mean like um, conferences or cultures where they didn't want to do virtually connecting or they did it and they hated it? I don't think anyone who's done it hated it, but there are a lot of people who resisted at first, the conference organizers, not so much the individuals. So, okay, so part of the thing that we have to sort of be aware of also is that a lot of us here already interact with each other on Twitter because we're on the radical edge of educational technology and we pretty much were the liberals of educational technology or something like we have a particular mindset. 
uh, most of the people who participate. And it sort of makes sense because they, they would be open educators who want to do this kind of thing. And they, they need to be a little bit tech savvy to sort of get into it. Uh, but there are conference organizers who initially are worried that we're sort of going to let people not want to go to their conferences anymore because we're doing this. But in reality, with experience, the more you do virtually connecting, the more you want to actually go physically to a conference because you really have such a good idea of whether you're going to like it or not. Um, there are okay. There are some conferences that have more conservative viewpoints, and we do the virtually connecting, and we keep saying bad things about the conference. <laughs> but they say, they tend to let us come in anyway. I think maybe as a kind of free speech thing. I'm not really sure. Um, but they tend to keep us. There are some conferences who have stopped their virtual end, like they don't do, uh, they don't sell virtual participation anymore, and they only do virtually connecting. So that's also an interesting. I don't think they did it because of us, but I think. Nobody misses the, the virtual conference. Everybody's happy with virtually connecting, I think. Um, I, think I don't know if anyone else has had other experiences. The, there was that one time, and then I'll pass it to Lorna. Um, I think there was some complaint that people felt like we were taking the keynoters away from the conference if we spent. You know, and so we, we've actually, you know, sometimes we just say, can you give us 15 minutes? And so we, we try to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, people who are there at the conference, um, People go to the conference to meet them, and so you know we don't demand. Oh, we must have an hour with you know the keynoter, um, but it is really special. And and often you know what I like is we usually try to get the keynoter like pretty soon after their talk, so they're just fresh off of the the stage and and all the reaction, and so that's really good. And and, and, as, and as Maha was kind of alluding to, there's kind of a range of cooperation. So sometimes conference organizers either we know or they're very open to the idea. They'll like set a room for us. They'll they'll like advertise. They'll fit it in their schedule. Other conferences are like they don't even know what we're doing, and we're kind of you know just doing our rogue thing, which is not really rogue. And so it's kind of an interesting spectrum of experiences uh, at the different conferences we've been part of. Lorna. Yeah, I think one of the other things is uh, working in the domain of open education. I think it's really important that we do try and make all our events as open as possible. Um, and I think virtual connecting is a really important way of doing that. Um, certainly last year I was involved in um, co-chairing the OER16 conference and we really did go out of our way to try and make sure that as many people could participate in the conference regardless of whether they could come and join us in Scotland. So we had vConnecting there, uh, we, we streamed all the keynotes, we made you know, extensive use of the hashtag. We also had um, one of our local colleagues um, doing something called Radio Edu Talk, which is not a million miles away from V Connecting, but just audio. And and I think one of the things that's important is that it's not exclusive. You know, that it's just it's another way to bring people in. It's another way to get ideas out there. Um, and I do think that's. I think it's important for for all kinds of um, educational and academic discourse. But I think it's particularly important working in the field of open education, that we need to make sure we are open, that we are inclusive, and we're talking to everyone, not just talking to a very small and select group of people. So, so that's certainly why I think it's, it's particularly important in the open education domain. Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, you can tell the difference of whether a conference organizer values virtually connecting on site or not. So if you, I mean, I've shown the ceiling more than one time now, but we actually we were approached by this organizer to um, if if we wanted to do virtually connecting, and they basically gave us a room. There's the gong again. Can you you recognize it, right? Um, so we have a distinctive room for this, which at other conferences you really have to fight for. So I remember I think Ma, you were mentioning the the online edica experience we had in Berlin last year, um, uh, where you basically. They were about to to shut a session, a workshop down that I gave because um, I introduced the the idea of connecting with folks <laughs> offside, mm -hmm. and the the go the the way we we found to to make it still happen was to record um, provocations and then talk about them during the coffee break so that they wouldn't like let they would still let me do my workshop. Um, but those are the spaces where I've, like. As, as we had in the section before, it's, it's like when you're close to the margins and you keep on pushing boundaries, that's where you actually can make progress happen. And that's one of those opportunities. And I think virtually connecting then provides that ledger, basically, because there is this community outside and they want to be part of this. Mm -hmm. I, I, 
I just really let that um, very, um, how, how do you say, um, this part that you actually um, have the, 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 the conference organizers really say yes or no to it and somehow they have to take a stance. And I really like this disruptive aspect of, of the idea. Because we were just discussing that there, uh, maybe you can share this story. I found that really interesting. Yeah, um, well, it has nothing to do with virtually connecting, but people organizing conferences, as you said, um, they might be afraid that they lose control or something. Um, because we were trying to organize, or we were about to organize, no, even more. We organized the bar camp in. Um, in the middle of Germany, um, and about three weeks before the bar camp was supposed to take place, um, even higher people than us said, no, this is way too um, dangerous. <laughs> what, what are you planning? You're planning a conference without a program? Are you trying to um, make it easy for yourself? Or what is this? I've never heard of that. They were all, excuse me, but old men. Um, so these five old men decided three weeks before the conference, no, no, you cannot um, do this conference. And we had to find keynote speakers and everything within three weeks in a hurry. That was Lower Saxony in Germany. Really, really sad. And that's only um, two months ago. So it's a very, very new experience. And that might, that might be the same type of fear which is behind not allowing people to connect virtually. Because crazy things could happen. The, the point of control <laughs> came up, Christian, in the previous session as well. There's a lot of that control word is very important here. Mm -hmm. It is. Ownership, control, who is in, who is in charge, who is in command. Yeah. And power, obviously. obviously. And frankly, it, it's a little bit easier when you're not official, to, to be honest. Um, I mean, we don't have to have permission from a conference to have a bunch of people huddle around a computer and have a, a video conference. It's it's just discussion, and so it's an added bonus in my mind when, when the conference organizers do work with you. But it, it seems like most of the time, within the community of people who've been doing virtually connecting, someone's like, "Hey, you know, I'm going to you know Fizz Widget 17. Um, um, this is a great speaker. We should do virtual connecting." And so. It's not coming from any central place where we're deciding, oh, we're definitely going to do OER Camp 17. Um, people going to conference think it's a good idea and kind of bring the idea to the group of people involved in virtual connecting. And, and so it's a rather interesting, loose way to run things. And, and I certainly like doing things this way rather than being all official. Any more questions? Comments from your side. Oh, I just want to add something very quickly. Occasionally, conferences like us so much that they offer complimentary registration to one of us, and that's really good in the sense that you know, if your institution is paying for you, you have to do work for your institution. So, if virtually connecting, you're getting the complimentary registration, then you sort of feel okay spending some of your time there doing virtually connecting. Um, but then the thing becomes is, do you then owe the conference organizers something? Do you have to be a bit nicer in what you do with it? And, it doesn't. Nothing particular usually happens when when it happens, but it's always something just to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, that yeah, sometimes it is cool to be just not affiliated at all and just doing your thing. Uh, but it's also good to feel like some conferences do appreciate us and, and want us to be there, and some of them are just doing it regularly now. So it depends on the size of the conference and the type of. Conference. So I think you missed the second gong here because I was muted. But the, the conference organizers, you can tell it's a German conference because um, we were <laughs> scheduled to, to be uh, done by 6.30 local time. And it is 6.30 local time, second gong. So maybe we could do a quick round of last comments if you have any in, in this room or virtually. But I think we should wrap it up in like a minute or so. Sorry it's about time, that. Time for beer. Um, yeah. <laughs> Finally, oh, you, you know us. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just taking a wild guess, but um, ho hopefully the folks there have some ideas about wanting to try this, and so we certainly hope you do. And I think that's the best way this spreads. I think um, 
some people look more enthused than others, but that might be due to the time it is. <laughs> so, totally understandable. We really thank you for gathering at the end of your day. It's been a great conversation. And, and reach out. We'd be happy to help anyone who's interested. Yeah. We're kind of crazy. Right. Thanks so, for your time, guys. Thank you for joining, everybody. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. Off eaters end, there they go. Uh, and yeah, everybody else is twiddling. Nice. So yeah, that was great. <laughs> that was good. It went Wonderful. exactly to unplanned. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to get Germans to be spontaneous. <laughs> <laughs> we we did not I failed, we did not get a close up of the tattoos. I, I Oh, I, I know that was very interesting. Next time, next yeah. time. But we got to see your double glow. That's even better. <laughs> He's crashing He's, on the couch. Yeah, still there. I've got, I've got like cats crashed out here. I've got one in the box and the one, oh, one on the chair. There, the one in the chair isn't even my cat. It's my neighbor's I was, cat. Just, I was expecting the full, the full floor show. We're still broadcasting, but yeah. there's four people. <laughs> There's four people Fine. watching us talk about dogs and cats. Let it be. Nice. Yes. <laughs> and I'm gonna watch to see if four important. goes down to three. Who's out there? This is the, this is important. This is important. <laughs> it's part of the post show. <laughs> the post show. Yeah. Well, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna keep you guys if you don't want to, but um. Yeah, no, I, I better head off now. So um, but yeah, always good, always great to catch up. Wonderful so you to take see care, you, guys. Lorna. Thanks for Thanks hanging out. Again. Bye for now. Okay, the broadcast Bye. is Bye. going down. Bye. <laughs>